The uh, project was very important, I think, uh, for the life of the diocese and also for our long-term stability and providing for the resources that we need to uh, provide the spiritual direction, the spiritual activity that is, of course, at the heart of whom we are. So we have, it, it was very important for me personally to be able to see this uh, accomplished, but even more so importantly, I think that the people, you know, we enjoy tremendous support and encouragement along the line, and to see how they have risen to the occasion, uh, it was really uh, very dramatic and uh, very impressive to me. So grateful for all their participation and what they were able to achieve. Now we have a brand new building. Ludwig uh, Mies van der Rohe was a German refugee from Hitler's time. He came to Illinois. He was an architect, uh, taught at Illinois State University for a while. And he is the first, uh, you know, historically across the world uh, to develop what they call the glass and steel approach to buildings. And now it's phenomenal. Everywhere you go, you see it. But he was the very first. So historically, he was important. And he did two buildings here in Des Moines, one on the Drake University campus and our building. Bishop William Bullock was the bishop at the time, recognized the value of being right across from the cathedral, etc. And um, he was able to influence a friend of his, um, Mr. Ohilski uh, and his wife, uh, to purchase the building and then to give it to the diocese as a gift because feeling that it could be extraordinarily valuable for the pastoral son. So Ed Ohilski went forward, a uh, Polish individual, got a lot of life, uh, didn't believe in a lot of fundraisers. Here's the check, Bishop, go for it. <laughs> You know, the architecture itself might be a little bit uh, cold, you know, <laughs> so we can come in. So we've tried to warm it up in terms of uh, uh, making a welcoming situation. And then, of course, we know that there's uh, the 100 employees are the warmest, friendliest, kindest uh, that you can possibly have. So <laughs> it certainly is a beautiful historical building. But even more, it speaks to me on different levels. The very first level is that it really represents coming together of uh, the very gifts and talents that our people have in order to have made it possible in terms of the renovation. Wonderful people, tremendously cooperative, happy people. You know? <laughs> so yeah, that, that was extraordinary. But the assets and representation and involvement. And then I think secondly, that as uh, the uh, involvement of our own staff was very critical and key, uh, and that they uh, went beyond the bounds in terms of generosity. You know, these uh, building projects can get a little bit uh, testy at times, but um, I think to uh, the credit of our um, people who were involved for the construction, et cetera, so it was the best building they've ever been associated with because of the relationships that were founded and that went, went forward. And then finally, as we um, uh, come to a kind of a conclusion, we're having three open houses, uh, cutting the ribbon, doing all those things that would be the normal experience at this time. But the last one is the one that I'm happiest about, is that everybody's welcome down here. And everybody come and see, and everybody come and see. It's your house, it belongs to you. What we do here is in your behalf, and uh, we are basically here to serve the needs of you uh, to bring our community together. In 2010, uh, it became a, an interest of mine uh, by being involved with the diocese on two earlier very small projects to help them learn about what they had uh, in Mies because this, this building was one of a kind and I knew about the 1980s period where the building was sold off after the Resolution Trust Corporation had to take over American Federal Savings and Loan, which was the successor to Home Federal. The furniture was sold off, a lot of architects bought the furniture, people came in from all over the country, and the architecture, though, was, was kind of an unfound gem. So we review requests when they come in from all over the diocese. So if a church wants to do an addition, if they want to do a new parish center, if they want to you know, rehab their, their worship space, um, make you know, any change over $50,000, typically that group of very high qualified professionals will greet them, they'll hear their proposals, and then the bishop hears the input of that building commission and then will will put together his response for the, the, the priest and the individual parish. There was a team member that I didn't mention and that was Jennifer James, Jennifer James Communications. Early on, Jennifer was identified and interviewed by the diocese, selected as a historic preservation, uh, historic consultant so that she could put the documentation together and why the building is important. So it was both looking at the history, but looking at the architecture. So there was a lot there in that document that would set the basis for 
How do you treat the building now when you want to rehab it? It all started with this very strict geometry rule. So they had a grid that was really in three dimensions. So every three foot four, for example, was a grid. It ruled the furniture, the electrical, the mechanical systems. Everything had to fit within that design vocabulary. So the Mies motto, less is more, really did apply. But in that type of a building, it's very difficult to achieve because you want a lot of things to disappear and yet be there. So the structure becomes the ornament. Things had dual purposes. The lighting was meant to flow from inside to outside. Therefore, you see the, the soffit continue to the outside. The grid on the floor was the same way. The materials, so they would often transfer directly from the outside to the inside, thus the plaza. Uh, continues so that building looks like it has an indoor-outdoor relationship which is now very popular but then uh, the architecture in the previous years was very closed in the historic revivalist periods the modern period blew out the walls it blew it open so that it became all about bringing the daylight in so this building is perfectly poised to be a very modern uh, comfortable to live in building with access to the outside The upper windows had a, a plastic film applied to the inside because the mechanical system was not able to handle the heating of the building from solar heat gain. And that had started to crack and fail, but we found that, okay, let's make the mechanical system do the work of making sure there was cooling on the south side, possibly at the same time you have air conditioning, or uh, cooling on the south while you might have some heating on the north because the building has different exposures, of course, with the sun. So the thermal dynamics have to be taken up to handle all these different conditions. It was discovered that the windows that were there did not meet the wind load requirement. It was decided that the steel had to be totally rehabbed, so the glass had to be removed. Once that happens, you cannot put it back because the glass did not meet the current safety standards. So the glass that was put back is slightly different. It's like an automotive glass. It has a plastic layer between, which helps the sound for the traffic outside, but yet it's, it's, it's more clear. The windows upstairs were slightly tinted, and that was followed in the rehab, the new glass upstairs. But basically, when you take the glass out, if it doesn't meet the current standard, you have to go back with new glass. And the big challenge was how to keep, uh, how to deter skateboard use on the benches. And so it was determined that you could raise little bumps on the paving around the benches and do it, do it in a very subtle way so that people could still use the plaza. And then hopefully the, you have to do some deterrent of some form because otherwise it's very difficult to manage that. It's very critical that you do not demolish or change the historic character defining elements of the building. So that space becomes a character defining feature. The stone, the travertine is a very important material to Mies. The granite on the floor, same way. Those are, those are materials that you try not to damage, you try to protect them, and you try to put them back the way you find them. So if you do have to take a panel off, uh, which became during construction quite a challenge because there needed to be a new door in the back but it had to look close enough but not match the original stainless steel doors on first floor only that are in that back area. So we needed larger restrooms. Before there were two tiny little restrooms. Well new restrooms had to be concealed yet provided for all the people that are going to use that space and to comply with code and just make it a practical issue so when you have no room at the end or a big event like that, you have enough room for people just to get to a facility. And also catering it didn't work as well as it could. So there's been improvements made to the back end of first floor in a very subtle way. So all throughout the process, the team involved the State Historic Preservation Office for an opinion, for review, to make sure that the tax credit benefits that were coming from the project weren't jeopardized. It's a 25% rebate on the work that qualifies. So it doesn't include the site, but it includes work within the building, all of it, mechanical, electrical. So it's a big benefit to the diocese to have a, a return on the investment in that manner. The diocese is, is, wants to do outreach, so they have a wonderful space to do that on first floor where they can have events there, people coming in, animate the plaza. And a big decision early on was to reactivate all of those lights around the outside of the building so that you don't have to put up security lights. It already provided it. So we simply went back, 
cleaned up the fixtures, put new interiors in the fixtures, make them light the space, and then we could take down the security lights that were tucked in behind the columns on the corners. Much of this credit goes to the people that kept going, making those daily efforts to make sure that the initial vision was upheld, which again, wasn't mine necessarily, it was really about the original and how best to keep it going. So what's happening in that area of Des Moines, there's a street grid shift. So as you come from the south up 6th Avenue, your streets correct themselves back to the polar coordinates. So, so you're about 15 degrees off the true north grid when you're in the middle of downtown. But as you go north, you start making small adjustments. And that adjustment in the street directions allowed a view of the cathedral from the south without putting the building and you know, making an odd angle on it. So the building is basically a square, predominantly, and that view up along that sloped eastern side of the site, the angled part of the site, gave you an open view of the cathedral. So now it's like, it's all meant to be. I was on the finance council of the, of the diocese for probably six or seven years now. And as chair of the finance council, I got to go to the pastoral center quite often. Uh, I looked at all the good work that they were doing at the pastoral center, but also noticed the degradation of the building. Uh, when the bishop asked us to help with the restoration of the building, we said, yes, that made a lot of sense to us because of all the good work that they're doing at the diocese and support of all the different parishes around the diocese. You know, the Catholic Charities, you look at the foundation of Southwest Iowa, uh, the Catholic housing, the education aspect of it, all the good work there. It needs support, and it's a great building, a great location, right in the center uh, of downtown Des Moines. Bishop said to us, you know, think about naming, because uh, he kind of focused on the education uh, aspect. And the first person that came to our mind was Sister Jude. She's not just a, uh, the principal or the chancellor, she is a very personal friend. And uh, we think the world of her. And so that's why when naming rights came up, we said Sister Jude would be perfect. She's, and this is so well deserved. Sister Jude is a really special place in our hearts, and we've known her for a long time, as Joyce has said. But she actually actually started the basketball, parochial basketball league. A lot of people don't know that, and our kids have been very much involved with basketball over the years. We were part of the parochial basketball for a long time. I was the director of it, and Joyce ran all the concession stands, and so it all started with Sister Jude, and so she's been a very special place in Catholic schools. Really, it was interesting to having the, the dynamic tension between the historic integrity of the building and the future functionality of the building, and they did an outstanding job of the restoration and came in under budget, which from the finance perspective, it was perfect. Looking at it purely from the outside, because of the uh, uh, expectations of the, maintaining the historic significance of the building and the architectural design, it didn't change dramatically uh, uh, looking at it. But the safety factors, for example, the, the tile or the stone out front, uh, the restoration of that is a safety factor. You look at the different uh, the uh, in, uh, financial, inter the en excuse me, the energy efficiency of the building has been improved significantly, which will help with the financial costs of it. Uh, a few of the things you'll come in and say well, there was not a lot of change until you actually look at it. All the windows were replaced, the seals were replaced, the sewer system was replaced. Uh, the integrity of the building was decaying, and just to restore that to. Uh, the significance, uh, it, it was amazing, the amount of work that was in and the detailed work that was in. I'd like to make a comment too about Bishop Pates. He's very insightful, he uh, very bright, and we all know that, brilliant. And I think just the fact that he got the right people in the right place and got this done. Well, I'm John Gaffney, 
and I am the Diocesan Director for Evangelization and Catechesis at the Diocese. As I was pondering uh, the, the, the space, uh, the conversation came, well, how can we collaborate in a new way that takes the structures of what we had? What would we do if we took people and put them in that big area? What kind of essential conversations could be happening that uh, would take what we're experiencing in the 80 parishes and experiencing when we're talking to people and then bringing it back in? And we know our mission. We know what we're uh, about with our ministry. We're focused on what Bishop's vision is. And yet, those essential conversations are in our mind. And then we can share them in a very comfortable, easy way, a very creative way around a table and then repurpose those offices for very specific conversations that we want to have happen. As director of youth ministry, it's largely working with parishes and parish leaders to uh, assist them in whatever ways they need, whether it's coming over to be a guest speaker or helping them with programming for the year um, and really help them walk with Christ and walk with them while they walk with Christ. I also, in that capacity, help put on our, at this point, annual um, youth rally in the fall. That plaza out in front, right there on Grand, is deceptively large. There's a lot of space there. Uh, and, you know, in the past, I believe some of the, the granite pieces were a little broken up, and so maybe it would have been harder to do things. But now that they've been restored, it's a perfect, a perfect venue to gather people together uh, just to say, hey, you know what, we're right here next to the cathedral. Uh, we're here in the community uh, welcoming people. Um, and it doesn't always have to be things that are explicitly um, Catholic in the sense of here's where you'll receive some theology or some catechesis. Uh, it, oftentimes it's just come together and we'll have some fun. So people oftentimes think of Des Moines as this really small metro, but in reality there's a ton going on here and the community is really, really rich with talent. So we're hoping this 601 Summer Series helps to highlight some of that talent. But we're trying to really plumb the depths of the musical community here in Des Moines. Rather than always bringing in you know, folks from all over the country and whatnot, we'd like to showcase the talents that are right here. Uh, whether it's music or food or photography or painting or sculpture, you know, all sorts of things really pull people together from our community and say, we've got some amazing stuff happening right here in all these sorts of artistic venues. Let's join at the Pastoral Center to enjoy them and to let them show us what they've got. So I think one of the things that's been good so far is I've been able to connect with a really, really vibrant young Catholic community here in Des Moines. Um, the young adults here who are serious about their faith and are really in interested in going further with it uh, in a variety of ways are really wonderful to work with and they've been key for the whole thing. Um, so much of what goes into the efforts of the church and the efforts of our diocese in particular uh, it really is only possible due to the support of others. You know, I was talking about how so much of what I do is just working with the young adults in the community. I wouldn't be able to do anything if they didn't step up and say, you know, I'll volunteer my time or I'll put forward a little bit of my resources to help make this work. And so, you know, it's wonderful that especially if we were to have a space right there on that first floor to acknowledge all of the support that we get and also then acknowledging the people we serve because they're oftentimes one and the same. My name is Kathy Zimpelman, and my husband Larry and I have lived in uh, the Des Moines area for 45 years. We are currently uh, members of St. John the Apostle Catholic Church in Norwalk, and we have three sons. When the bishop first approached us and was talking about it, he was talking about, we knew that the Pastoral Center needed renovation. Uh, we are big fans of Mies van der Rohe and his work, and so we were very glad to hear that the bishop was going to stay downtown. And one of the things that he said to us, which really stuck with us, was that he wanted the diocese and the church to be good neighbors to and good stewards of our downtown. And so we, we liked that very much. And we were, um, we're grateful we've had the opportunity to help bring the Pastoral Center back because it is, in our minds, the hub of the parish, and we wanted it to stay in a place where all people could have access to the services that they have and the programs that they offer. And so we're very glad that it moved forward and that we're 
very close to being done. So it's exciting. It's very exciting. Uh, I know people who work there. I know their passion is real and genuine. And what they do each and every day serves all of us in the diocese because they are the hub. They are the place where people can go if they need help or if they need support or if they just need education. That's one of the reasons that we wanted to support the restoration of the Pastoral Center downtown because access is easier for a lot of people who live downtown or live on, on the outskirts of downtown. I like that it's, that it's there for them. That's, that's always been important to Larry and me. And if we've been able to help in any way in that, then we're very grateful. There's a lot of exciting things going on in downtown Des Moines. And, you know, as Bishop said, he wants the diocese and the church to be good neighbors. And uh, that was, Larry and I loved hearing that because that's what we want to. That's what principals always wanted as well, just to be good stewards of our city. Larry and I have sponsored the plaza because we loved the bishop's ideas for the plaza. He wants to have an open space where people could come and feel welcome. There will be music and celebrations and concerts and people will be able to use it in conjunction with other things going on downtown and Larry and I like that very much. It is our hope, because it is named for our family, that families all over central Iowa, all over the diocese, will feel welcome to come to the plaza. And it is also our hope that our children and grandchildren will be able to come there and see a part of their legacy. My uh, first uh, sentiment is of great gratitude that we've had some wonderful people participate in it. The Blue Ribbon Committee, all of those from our staff who have been very instrumental in making it such a success. The donors, where would we be without the donors who came forward with great generosity, great support, and ongoing encouragement. So, you know, we're a perfect uh, group together. Also our priests and our deacons and all those who are serving in our parishes. Along the way, we're very curious, how is it coming, when, when we come and see it, and recognizing the value of it. It's extraordinarily important that we welcome those who are refugees, uh, part of our community today because of the immigration welcome that was given to them through Catholic Charities, also the Hispanics, all the others. Come, come, you know, it's your church, our community, and ones that we hope to, through that, the instrumentality, say, we're at the face of Christ. We are the face of love. We are the face of the one body that uh, Jesus intends us to be to the world. That is, uh, Pope Francis so often says, we can bring a little joy. We can bring a little hope. We can bring, you know, rejoicing because uh, that's who we are as Christians. That's who we are, hopefully, as Catholics. And hope, just to, to a small extent, I hope that building symbolizes that posture.